This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. It's Obehave with Arden Moore, the show that teaches you how to have harmony in the household with your pets. Join Arden as she travels coast to coast to help millions better understand why cats and dogs do what they do. Get the latest scoop on famous faces. They're perfectly pampered pets in Who's Walking Who in Rin Tin Tinseltown. From famous pet experts and best-selling authors to television and movie stars, you'll get the latest buzz from wagging tongues and tails. Garner great pet tips and have a doggone fur-flying fun time. So get ready for the pause and applause as we unleash your all-behave host, America's pet edutainer, Arden Moore. Welcome to the Obehave Show on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Arden Moore. Orangutans. These great apes rank as one of the most amazing yet mystifying species on the planet. Now, to really study and understand them takes a lot of dedication and sacrifice. And for 50 years, scientist Barute Mary Galdicus has studied, rehabilitated, and released hundreds of orangutans back into the rainforest in Southeast Asia. Now, with all she has experienced, she has quite a tale to tell. And who better to tell her story than our special guest? She is an award-winning author with more than a dozen books in print, including children's books and even one about singer Pete Seeger. And she's here today to share with us gems from her latest book published by National Geographic. It's called Undaunted, The Wildlife of Barate Mary Galdigas and her fearless quest to save orangutans. Everyone, please welcome to our show the very prolific author, Anita Sylvie. Welcome to the show, Anita. Oh, thank you very much. All right. Now, folks, Anita is going to share with us how and why Barete spent five decades studying this primate and much more. But first, we need to take a commercial break. So you know the drill. Sit and stay. We'll be right back. Time for a pause. For furry ones, actually, sit and stay. All behave. We'll be right back. Pause up, everybody. This is your host, Arden Moore. And guess what? I wear different collars in the pet world. I am also a master instructor in pet first aid and CPR. And I have some great news for all you. Safety is one of the best skills you can learn for pets that you have and those that you care for from other people. That's why I'm excited to let you know we now have a two-day online interactive pet first aid instructor program. Yep, I have teamed up with Pro Pet Hero and I am your instructor. We use Zoom technology, which is great. So you can be wherever you are in North America. I can tap into you and we have a class of up to six people at a time for two days and we teach you all the veterinary approved hands-on skills to become a pet first aid and CPR instructor. To learn more, please go to Pro Pet Hero.com. This is your chance to be your pet's best health ally. Let's talk pets on PetLifeRadio.com. All Behave is back with more tail wagging ways to achieve harmony in the household with your pets. Now back to your fetching host, America's pet edutainer, Arden Moore. Welcome back to the Obehave Show on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Arden Moore. My special guest today is Anita Sylvie. She's a mighty wordsmith, a dogged researcher, and a master storyteller. Her latest book chronicles the world of orangutans in the Borneo rainforest. It's located in Southeast Asia. The title is just one powerful word, undaunted. Now, the subtitle contains lots of words. It is the wildlife of Barete Mary Galdigas and her fearless quest to save orangutans. I had to take a couple breaths to say that subtitle, um, Anita. Well, yeah, they like to get a lot of information in the subtitles, so, you know. 
<laughs> I think so. Well, your um, publisher does that, by the way. I the know, title, I know. The, the title, the cover, do you know what I mean? That's not what we do as authors. We try to, to tell the story and then let them put it into a package. And, of course, Nat Geo does such a beautiful job of putting, you know, the right photographs there and telling the story. Absolutely. Let's dive in. You, you've written, I guess, what, 13 books? And you've been an yeah. editor and a, a publisher. So words really are your life, aren't they, Anita? Oh, yeah. I mean, and they have been my life since I was, you know, I mean, my earliest memories are as a young child delving into books. And during summers, I would go to the library and literally I'd be sitting outside, you know, with piles of books by my chair, just reading and reading. Many of my classmates say that they think it's wonderful that I went into children's books because they have this memory of me as a child always pressing another book in their hands and saying, oh, you're going to love this. You know, this is such a good book. So I have been involved in the world of literature and language and and thinking about, you know, what make the best books for children? How do we get them excited about possibilities? How do we educate? How do we delight them? And how do we give them the best? That's really what my career has been about. Well, that's a great career. And, you know, when uh, National Geographic comes a-knocking, and they say, hey, Anita, we've got an uh, opportunity for you to write a book about a primatologist and write it for kids. What made you say yes? Well, they, uh, they called me, um, my editor, Kate Hale, called me to first um, present the idea of writing a book about Jane Goodall. Okay. Because she was coming up on her 80th birthday, and there wasn't a modern biography. You know, there wasn't something that looked at all her life. Most of the books about Jane Goodall are about those years, that early years, where she spent doing research. And I said, yes, automatically. I had worked at Houghton Mifflin, which, of course, Houghton had published all of her books. So I'd read her books. I knew her editor even, you know, and the person who'd worked with her, her career at Houghton. And I thought, oh, well, I really know something about her. And, of course, the, the thing about starting a project is you think you know something about the right. person. And then, uh, yeah, you know, and then there's that moment where you realize, you know, and you may even pull together a proposal and you think you know something. And then there comes that moment where you realize, I don't know anything. You know, like I really have completely whole areas of this person's life I don't know. So I then, after I finished the Jane Goodall book. Let's tell everybody what it is. The title is called The Wild Life of Jane Goodall. So we want people to buy all your books. So yeah, from one author. Right. to another, I'm trying to help you out here. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Untamed, The Wild Life of Jane Goodall. So after I finished that, I had really gotten intrigued by Dr. Barute, as she likes to be called, and because she was different from other animal researchers. You know, most of them go out, they go out for six years or 10 years, they get their doctorate, they write up their research, they write their books, and then they do other things, just as Jane Goodall had done. But she decided to stay. Like, she never left the camp that she founded in Borneo. And that was such an unusual story that I really wanted to figure out who was this woman who would live in primitive conditions. I mean, she's got a little better house now, you know, than she did, but who would live in this place so far away from home. And what she said was that she went for the science but she didn't know she would make lifelong friends. And she couldn't leave the animals. She couldn't leave the orangutans. You know, and so many of them, by the way, they, they can be 60 years or older. You know, they're animals that she has known for like decades, the way we know our friends for decades. Right. And so I really wanted, she was so special as just, a, you know, somebody who had done such an incredible thing that the joy for me in the book was getting to know her, interview her, and understanding her life and really what motivates her and what drives her. So so this was a case where I I presented it to them and they said, sure, go ahead, which is always nice too. Oh, book, yeah. You know, they can come different ways. You know, sometimes you think of them, sometimes they think of them for you. But, you know, I just felt like I'd really been given this gift of, you know, being able to think about her life and read about it and read interviews. And, you know, every time I wanted to escape my own life, I just went to the jungle of Borneo <laughs> in my mind. <laughs> well, that's what saves I on airfare. I recommend, airfare. <laughs> you know, books like this because it really got me out of whatever was ailing me in the moment. So, um, well, it was you, a fabulous... You seem to have a parallel uh, childhood. I mean, 
Dr. We're going to call her Dr. B or Dr. Burete. Uh, she wrote your forward, and in the forward, uh, she said uh, she has been curious since she was a child, and that scientists are people who never lose their curiosity. I don't know about you, Anita, but I think that also applies to us writers. Don't you agree? Oh, absolutely. And you know what? I identified so much with her as a child. She was she um, grew up in Toronto, Canada, and there's a huge park, a high park in Toronto, and you know, but it's very wild in spots. And every moment she could, she would go, and she, she would wonder, you know, and she'd look at the ponds and every kind of animal, bird, tree, whatever she could see. She was just fascinated by it. And I grew up in, in rural Indiana, northern Indiana. Fort Wayne. Birds, <laughs> Fort Wayne is my hometown. I'm and, from Crown Point. Oh, you are. Okay. Well, that area at that time, there were still virgin forests, you know, wow. that had not been cut down. I mean, that the, those were, you know, and so I would wander in those forests and just look at everything and realize that, you know, when, when Johnny Appleseed came to the area, as he did, <laughs> the, yeah. the, the, you know, he, he's, he's buried in that area, that these were the forests that he saw, and, the, and you know, and he, these were the animals. So I so identified with her quest for learning about the natural world around her. I, however, I could never live in the wilderness for 48 <laughs> years, and... Uh, <laughs> Well, that's all right. My idea, of a good, my idea of a good time is a nice hotel room. So, you know, I mean, in that way, you know, in yeah. that way, I'm very different from her. But I really felt uh, she was, she felt like a kindred spirit, you know. And part of what I really love about her is she's a true believer, you know, like she never, she did everything for her cause. Like she's never given up. She's never given in. And she's, you know, she's now saving these animals and the fact that there's no cynicism in her that there you know everything is very pure in her devotion and dedication that made her so attractive to me and she is the uh, founder of the orangutan foundation international can you tell us a little bit about that Yes, she has her, her foundation is the Rangang Foundation International, and it's set up to both um, preserve the animals, but also to preserve their environment, the rainforest. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what she's fighting for is so that there will be places where they can be. She ma has managed to get the area around where she originally set up, set up as a, a park. It's protected. She works very closely with the Indonesian government. And if anyone wants to, you know, support the cause of, of keeping uh, these magnificent animals alive, it's just a great foundation and does a lot of work. They share, by the way, they share 97% of our DNA. Oh, so wow. They are they, yeah, they are our distant cousins without question. You know, these are creatures that um, are so much like us in so many ways. So keeping them alive, her, her whole goal today is keeping them alive, keeping, you know, saving every animal that she can. That sounds great. Hey, listeners, we're speaking with author Anita Sylvie. We're talking about orangutans, and we're going to find out why we don't call it that a rhyme with that drink. It's not orangutans. After we pay for this a show by taking this quick commercial break. So sit and stay. We'll be right back. Time for a walk on the red carpet, of course. All Behave will be back in a flash right after these messages. Hey, it's me again. Yep, Arden Moore, host of the Old Behave show, doing this commercial. You know what I love? I love my cats. I love pet safety cat Casey. I love my sweet Mikey. And I love one-eyed Morty. Each one has their unique personality. Casey's a pet safety cat and teaches pet first aid. Mikey loves to lounge on the couch and purr in your lap. And one-eyed Morty, he's just a purr, purr, purr machine. Now, you know what I don't love? Cleaning up the litter for Casey, Mikey, and Morty, which is why Arm & Hammer created new cloud control litter. There's no cloud of nasties now when I scoop. It's 100% dust-free. It's free of heavy perfumes, and it reduces airborne dander from scooping. Yahoo! So, what happens in the litter box stays in the litter box. New cloud control cat litter by Arm & Hammer. More power to you. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. 
Hi, this is Joyce DeWitt. You may remember me from Three's Company, inviting you to have the good sense to tune in to the adorable, amazing Arden Moore on Oh Behave on Pet Life Radio. We're back from the lot. Just checked the paper and we had a record showing at the box. The letterbox, that is. Now back to Oh Behave. Here's Arden. Welcome back to the Oh Behave show on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Arden Moore. I always love having a great author in the house, and we have one today. We're speaking with Anita Silvey. She has written more than a dozen books, uh, including one on Jane Goodall, the singer Pete Singer, and lots of children's books. She's been an editor and a publisher, and her latest book, that I want you to get your paws on, and it's from National Geographic Kids, but trust me, it's for the kid and all of us. It's called Undaunted, the wildlife of Berete Mary Galdegas and her fearless quest to save orangutans. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14 words in the subtitle, everybody. That could be a, almost a new record, right, Anita? Well, it is a lengthy subtitle. But, you, know, it, <laughs> you know, with Nat Geo, it's accurate. You know, they are sticklers for making sure that every fact in the book is correct. So same is true for subtitles as it is in the book. Oh, I know. I know. Now, we're talking about this amazing woman. And I know in the book, you talk about the trimates, actually. So can you identify who the trimates are? Yes, um, Lewis Lakey, who did, uh, Lewis and his wife Mary, who did, right. uh, found some of the fossils of the early, you, you know, early humans in Africa. He thought that our, the great apes, who are the most closely connected to us uh, in DNA, should be studied because they might help us understand how early man behaved. Okay. And so he went out to recruit basically three extraordinary women to go in and do studies of the great apes in, in the wild. The first was Jane Goodall, who studied chimpanzees. And they, by the way, they share 99% of our DNA. The okay. second was Diane Fossey, who um, went to study mountain gorillas in Rwanda, and they share 98.3% of our DNA. And the third was the youngest of the trimates is Dr. Berberte Galdakos, and she was passionate about orangutans, and so she went to Borneo, um, part of Indonesia, to study them in the wild. And they, of course, share 97% of our DNA. So Lakey had wanted them to learn everything they could about animal behavior. Now, this is in, by the way, 60s and Dr. Galdakos, 1971, women scientists out in the field for extended periods of time, by the way, was not the norm. I mean, it wasn't no. in many, <laughs> many cases. It wasn't even accepted. And in the case of Jane Goodall, they wouldn't allow her to go to Tanzania, uh, to Gombe, without a chaperone. And so Jane's mother volunteered to go live with her in primitive conditions so that Jane wow. could start a, a chimpanzee. Yeah, talk about a good mom. I mean, you know, few of us would probably do that. You know, it's a, it's a pretty amazing thing. So all of them do have, you know, they, all of them are not expected to be able to find out what they do. But um, Lewis Lakey really believed that women made the best scientific observers and that that's what he wanted. He, he said he didn't need somebody whose mind had been cluttered by scientific theory. He wanted women who could look at things and see things and make observations. And by the way, he made his decisions about all three of them rather quickly. He said he used his intuition. Very I mean, he well. Interviewed them. <laughs> he used his intuition extraordinarily well. Yeah. I mean, it's quite amazing. And of course, all of all three were highly successful and put in more hours than any scientist up until that time in their area of study. So. Well, yeah, and it and it got a little personal too. Um, Doctor B uh, actually uh, has one of her daughters named after Jane. Correct? She absolutely does. Her daughter was named after Jane Goodall. First, she went to London to meet with Jane Goodall and Louis Lakey and their family. So she got to know the family, and then she did, you know, her study under Jane at Gombe. I mean, she went to see how you conduct a good wildlife study and how you set up a camp and, you know, how you do all those things that are not particularly intuitive for anybody who's not been there. 
and Jane and she remain in close contact even till this day. You know, Jane wrote some really nice comments about her for my book. And so, they, and at one point, the three of them, when, when Diane Fossey is teaching at Cornell, the three of them travel around the country together. Oh, how I wish I could have been oh, my one of gosh. those lectures. Oh, yeah. Like that, you would be in the room <laughs> with all three of them talking about, and Jane, of course, always does this chimpanzee hoot at the beginning really? of... Yeah. Oh, that's how she opens all her lectures. It it gets the audience's attention. I can tell you that. You know, there's not a the, the pin can drop. And Diane was great on gorilla sounds. So Jane is making chimpanzee sounds, and Diane's doing gorilla <laughs> sounds. And you know, <laughs> and well, they're all showing what's Dr. photos of is she, uh, is she doing any orangutans? No, she, orangutans are harder. I've listened to that call. It's a little harder. She's not a, she didn't do that. But of course, they all have these gorgeous pictures and they're all doing breakthrough research at this time because this is in the early 1980s. So here you have three women scientists who are so accomplished. And Lakey, by the way, I mean, I mean, continued to raise money for them all of, you know, I mean, he was all of his life. Not only did he, you know, get them out there and support them, he continued to support them both, you know, um, personally and financially throughout their careers. So he really made a major contribution. Um, to well, think life. about it. They, they're they the modern day version of the monkeys. They're the new rock band, if you think about it. They're doing their own kind of music, but it's for a good cause, and that's to help people understand more about primates, right? So take that, <laughs> Davy Jones and Mickey Dolans and all those people, right? <laughs> Here come the real I've monkeys. Ne- <laughs> I've never heard them compared to the monkeys. But well, that just right. came in my brain. I, I had two cups of coffee today, so blame it on the caffeine. I don't know. but um, That's okay. So- but you're right. They are. I mean, like, th- these are the rock band of scientists. You know, I mean, Jane Goodall is the most recognized scientist in the world today. So, And here they are women, and here they did this uh, really much against, I mean, they don't get a lot of support. I, they get an enormous amount of support from their mentor, but they don't get much support from the scientific community, as you might imagine, because, you know, they were they were disproving things that scientists believed about our closest relatives. So now they have, of course, enormous respect, but in the time, they had to fight for their, oh, as it yeah. were, they had to fight for their recognition. Well, I was amazed to see some photos in your book where Dr. Beretti's children were playing with orangutans. Oh, yeah. No, they... Um, from the beginning, we've got a fabulous photo of her first, or her son in a bath with orangutan, you know, hanging on. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they, yeah, you know, I mean, just take a bath together. They are playing with infant orangutans. So uh, orangutans are, by the way, I mean, many people have the wrong image of the great apes. I mean, these are really peaceful animals, you know, and a, a mature adult male may fight another mature adult male, you know, in a territory. But these are, they're plant eaters. They're really, you know, they're gentle with each other. The babies stay with their mother for eight years. Like they never leave the side. Yeah. You talk about good moms. They never leave the side of their mother basically for eight years. So they are the, you know, the small creatures, they really need that kind of touching, cuddling, you know, being around, having contact. And if they've been orphaned, you know, uh, Dr. Berude started to bring them into her camp and ra- find out how we're going to raise them so that they can be released to the wild. So, yeah, her kids, you know, her kids grew up with, you know, young orangs as their best friends, you know. Well, they, think about it. Like, if you're at a school, you're not going to get picked on if your buddy's an orangutan. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Yeah, what you need my friend. You know, we call him even orange. an imaginary friend would be a that'd be a good one. Yeah. <laughs> now with with this and and this is just playfulness, but people always mispronounce and say orangutan. Does that just put the hair up on your arm? You know, I have no. I had so much trouble learning to pronounce it. Anyway, it's without the G. It's orangutans. I always pronounce it with the first G. So you know, I, I sometimes call them orangs. So that that shortens it, makes it easier. I think it, you know, I think it just matters that you know how gorgeous these creatures are. You know, they're tall, the males can weigh about 200 pounds, they've got a seven-arm span, so that's so they can swing between the trees, they have huge shoulders, 
They have opposable thumbs, which makes it possible for them to do things like one of the ones in camp like to cook. So could you, you know, could dump flour and sugar and all kinds of things and stir it up and make concoctions, you know, so they have a great deal of flexibility in their body and in their hands. And they are all such individual creatures, you know, they're just, that's what Dr. Barute really showed me when I would interview her because she'd start to talk about them the way you, you know, the way I would talk about my best friend next door, you know, my childhood friend or, and that they each had such distinct personalities. So, well, they do, uh, you do uh, have a little family scrapbook with some of them like named Percy and Gina and Thor and Tom and Pan and so on in the back of the book. It's really well organized from that standpoint, because you also have some things about some plants you do a little kind of a life of timeline of Dr. Reddy uh, that I really like too, because, you know, for whether it's for kids or the kid and all of us, the back of the book has got some good stuff, Anita. Oh, oh yeah. This gets credited, of course, to National Geographic, you know, the, the maps. This is, of course, part of what their whole mission is. It really is educating, you know. So it's educating you about the geography, about the plants, about the animals. Um, I really wanted to make the individual animals a feature from the beginning of the book. So that's why I start off in the first, in my introduction called First Contact, you see this vision of this huge male orang. Right. um, Dr. Barute, it's the first time she's ever been on the ground close to one. And she used to say, they look like aliens, you know, like why do people want to go into outer space when you can see something so amazing in real life? You know, they have this the picture of this huge male. And so you get to, from the beginning, I wanted to, you know, she's the star of the book, but they are the supporting cast. And, you know, so they well, really, you know. Yeah. I like the uh, I like how you said uh, that she found the gaze almost hypnotic. Yes, yeah. It's it's as if the first time she saw one, she saw a picture of one. It's like it just took her over. Like she and it, she, you know, she's very spiritual. One might be if you'd spent you know fifty years in another culture, away right. from her home. But she always says, "I was born to study." this animal. I was, you know, absolutely, uh, this was my calling from the time I was young. And, and it, when it took her over, she just knew she had to do it. And she really didn't know how she was going to until um, Louis Lakey came to speak at UCLA. And everything and happened she, from there. Yeah, everything happened from there. You know, we hear about in Hollywood, you know, the star in the, the coffee shop getting their chance. Well, you know, here we are in in Los Angeles and a scientist gets her chance to go and do her life's work. Now, because uh, I can't see you trudging in the rainforest for 50 years, how did you get your research? I know you do interviews with her, but can you give us from a a writer standpoint, some of the legwork that you needed to do? Well, I, you know, I have things that I have to do. Like, I have to have primary source documentation. I don't write for kids if I don't. But right. fortunately for her, we have her autobiography. There are a, ton, a lot of interviews. I was able to personally interview her. You know, any questions that I had, she went over pages four times. So if we, any questions we had down to the final thing. Then, of course, there's that whole kind of immersing yourself in the area, you know, watching any movies on Borneo, National Geographic shows, you know, whatever is around. Fortunately, in her case, there was a fabulous film narrated by Morgan Friedman, um, Uh Born to be Wild, and it really shows segments of her there, and that really gave me some of the sense. And then it's just, when you're a writer, it's sort of like everything that you do it's almost like the universe conspires to help you write that book, you know. So right. it would be a you know an odd sentence in a Gerald Durrell book about Corfu, and you know it would apply to what I was doing there. So that's a lot of what I do. I just do a lot of reading, viewing around what I'm working on, and you know sometimes it's one word, it's two words, it's an idea. It's hard to describe how it happens, but you just keep 
immersing yourself. I, I had two years from beginning to end of this book, so I had two years where I could really immerse myself in her life and the way she was thinking and what was going on. So that's really what I think you try to do. And then, you know, it's like a 1% of that gets in a book for children because you have a story to tell and 1500 words. So if you're writing books for adults, you actually get to put a little more of what you know in the book because, you know, it's, you have more words that you can use. But I love the, I mean, writing is horrendously hard. Research is just, you know, I mean, like if I'm a good person on earth, I believe I will go to a great research library in the sky. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you don't have to worry about overdue charges, right? Oh, no overdue, no books due. Do you know what I mean? I just yeah. go to be able to go research. I mean, research is the most wonderful. Th- and I, by the way, again, I always felt that. I loved it as a kid. I loved big research papers as a kid. No one ever said to me, you know, you might become a nonfiction writer if you really love research as much. But, you know, I really do. So the, there's just immersing yourself. And, of course, it made it really special for me in that I always knew if there was something I didn't know, I could go back to her, you know, or if I had a question or if we got anything wrong, she would be there to, you know, correct that and make sure that the book worked. Jane Goodall also, by the way, also went over pages and manuscript very thoroughly. So did the Goodall Institute. So having having that kind of backup is, of course, very reassuring. Well, I love it. And then do you want to give a little shout out to uh, Pete Singer? Because uh, he had quite a life and story to tell. The one I saw was he went to, I guess, Spain, and mm-hmm. the folks told him, yeah, you can have a concert, but these are the songs you can't sing. And and they turned out to be his whole lineup of songs. So tell the listeners what he actually did to get around that. Well, Pete Seeger, in the book is called um, Let Your Voice Be Heard, and it's the life and time of, of Pete Seeger. Of course, he, he's faced all of this McCarthy censorship in the United States. He's blacklisted. You know, he finally gets to go out and go around the world, and here, as you say, he comes to Spain, and, you know, he can't sing the songs. So he follows the letter, as it were, of the instructions. <laughs> he doesn't sing them. He goes on stage, and he plays them, and he asks the audience to sing them, and the audience, of course, all know the songs, and so they have a sing-along without, with him doing the chords, as it were, and just um, leading people in that. He loved hootenannies, you know, this was a right. work for people getting together and sing, so he just did a hootenanny on the stage in Spain, using all of his songs, only he wasn't actually singing them. The main reason to do a book on Pete Seeger is getting to talk to Pete Seeger, as you might imagine. Right. Um, just one of the great figures, and he was quite wonderful. And his nephew had told me, you know, before I called him for the first time, he said, you know, if you don't have two hours for Pete, don't call him, because <laughs> he, w- <laughs> he will talk as long as he wants to talk, and it may be two hours. That was absolutely true. He was so generous with time, but he would get very excited about things and ideas, and he was particularly excited about the idea of his story being in the hands of fourth and fifth graders because that's at the point where kids develop a social conscience. But yeah, I'd call him and two and a half hours later, and he'd sing to me on the phone. And Oh, oh I mean, it was, just, it was just amazing. So You anyway, could have had your so answer was, machine message be him. I know, that's true. I could have, should have recorded. Well, I, I do record them, but I have them on another kind of recording. Mm-hmm. But no, Or so maybe he, Jane he, uh, Goodall doing, uh, you know, one of her primal. That's true. I could I could have a chimpanzee hoot. I could record. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Look what You're right. You have all these good ideas. I, I, I think that would stop uh, some of the spammers <laughs> and you know all that if you just have a, a chimpanzee sound from Jane Goodall coming on your on your voicemail. <laughs> I think that would stop all those people who are trying to sell me medical equipment or. <laughs> Whatever it is they're trying to sell, you're right. I will think about that. I'll think about getting a hoot on Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I bet weird things pop in my head too, Anita. Folks, I have been delighted to have as our special guest today the amazing author, Anita Sylvie. Her latest book is with uh, National Geographic Kids. It's called Undaunted, The Wildlife of Barete Mary Galdicus and Her Fearless Quest to Save Orangutans. And I really think that this is a great book that you should give for your kids or grandkids and even for yourself. As always, 
with NG. The, the photos are just popping off the pages, but the back of the book has got some maps and timelines and a little who's who of the big O's that she has met. And it's a, a very wonderful story that you have weaved, Anita, and I'm so glad you could be a guest on our show. Thank you. It, it really has been a lot of fun. I appreciate you're talking about this topic. All right. Anything uh, else you'd like to add before we say adieu? No, I think that that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what the goal is. It's cold, old behave. In fact, uh, somebody named Oprah. I don't know. Do you know Oprah? Um, yeah. First, she, she uh, named our podcast for two years in a row as one of her top three. Oh, how nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we've just got mentioned that our podcast is now for the, I think the fourth time or fifth time, my producer will correct me, has been named a finalist in the podcast awards. So we are poor and famous like most <laughs> right, <Anita. laughs> Like most writers, right? You are yeah. yeah. Oh, Mark you, just you are famous but poor. Yeah. It's the fifth time. The fifth time. That's not bad. Yeah, yeah. that is yeah, excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you. It really was nice to talk to you. All right, and at this time, also, I want to give a shout out to my producer, Mark Winner. He is the wizard of pause for this show and all the shows on Pet Life Radio. It's the world's largest pet radio network, and that's pretty cool. And also at this time, um, I don't do any ape calls or chimps or orangutans. I just want to tell everybody, until next time, this is your flea free host delivering just two words to all you two, three, and four-leggers out there. Oh, behave. Coast to coast and around the world, it's all behave with Arden Moore. Find out why cats and dogs do the things they do and get the latest buzz from wagging tongues and tails in Rin Tin Tinseltown. From famous pet experts and best-selling authors to television and movie stars, you'll get great tail-wagging pet tips and have a fur-flying fun time. All behave with America's pet edutainer, Arden Moore, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.